Hey everyone, Nathan here again. Finally, eventually, absurd being. It's been a long time since I've said that. Uh, yeah, it has been a long time. I, uh, I, I mean, I've been busy in this in the interim. I've been been preparing for the next series on um, Henri Bergson, uh, but I really should have should have wrapped up Milo Ponti. A long time ago. I kind of got caught up reading Bergson before I finished those Milo Ponti videos and then um, once I finished I, I hadn't done the diagram. I hadn't made that diagram, my summarizing diagram yet for the phenomenology of perception and uh, I just it just kind of got delayed and when I did finally do it I was like oh maybe I'll, I'll just wait until I'm ready to do the Bergson series and then I'll start filming regularly again just yeah so it's been long overdue this this final video for Milo Ponti but um, but here it is so uh, my plan for this video is just to go through uh, my diagram which is an attempt to summarize phenomenology of perception uh, and hopefully it makes things a little bit clearer it just puts things puts the whole thing onto one page so kind of you can kind of get a feel for um, the, uh, the the main ideas kind of in your head at once um, I, I'm always unsure whether these diagrams are, are helpful or not I, I think this one is one of my more useful diagrams just because I, I finished it like maybe six seven weeks ago um, and then didn't look at it at all for the, in the interim while I was focusing on Bergson uh, and I was worried actually when I went back to it today that um, it wasn't going to make any sense to me but it, surprisingly um, it did and, uh, and it, it was uh, everything kind of fell into place as I was reading it so hopefully it, um, it, you find it useful as well it, it could just be that I wrote it, I made it, so it has some kind of meaning for me, but hopefully you find it useful as well. I'm just going to run through it. There are two diagrams actually. The first one, the one that I'm going to show you is the um, kind of the skeleton. It's, it's the, just, just has the, the main groupings. Um, there's a more in-depth diagram, same structure, but I've just got more details in there. Um, that's what I'm going to be reading from or, or looking at as I'm explaining each each area. Um, both of these I'm going to make available on my website um, somehow. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that yet. Probably probably a link, a downloadable downloadable file or something. Anyway, that'll all be on my website sometime. Hopefully, sometime next week. Uh, anyway, let's jump to the diagram and have a look. Okay, so you can see there at the top, the first thing I'm, I'm, we're looking at is the phenomenal field. And if you go to the, the top left there, you can see I've written, this is already a reduction. This is the first reduction from the objective world. So we've got the world of <clears throat> science. We've got things um, as science and as, as kind of common sense would would have us view things the materialistic um, conception of the world so that's the objective world and this phenomenal field is already a reduction from that so we're looking to understand how things make sense for us how and that this is what phenomenology is right trying to understand how it is that we, we, we sense things, that things appear the way they do. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to go beneath just um, clumps of matter, right? So that's what this, this first reduction is. So we're at this phenomenal field, this, this level of the phenomenal field. A couple of things to say about this before we, we look at each of those um, boxes. The phenomenal field is what enables things to always already have a sense for us. So it's it's this it's the way in which things appear for us essentially. 
Um, and that means that it's necessarily hidden from us. So we don't, we're not immediately um, directly aware of it, explicitly aware of it, because if we were, it would be another thing in the world, right? So in order for, for it to kind of um, grant us access to things, to allow us to perceive and, and sense things, it, has, it itself has to be hidden. Uh, in this phenomenal field, things appear for us as figures on backgrounds. And importantly, the phenomenal field is ambiguous and non-thetic. So this is not um, kind of a clear, definable structure. It's necessarily a little bit hazy. It's necessarily ambiguous. It's kind of like um, something you can... Yeah, it's just not black and white. There are just no distinct, no clear distinctions to be drawn here. It's by, by definition, it's it's um, a little bit ambiguous. Okay, so that's what the phenomenal phenomenal field is, um, and we're just gonna I'm just gonna go through that first box there, sensing. And this from Alo Ponti was uh, basically a lived communication. He calls it a communion with the world. So we're we're really looking at a, at a um, kind of a holistic way of understanding our relation with things. So he devoted the first part of phenomenology of perception to sensing, sensation, and, uh, and, and that's kind of the summary there was that it, that was the punchline. It's a, it's, a, it's a lived, engaged, sorry, it's a lived engagement with things. That's what sense, sensing is. Um, he even says, we can think of sensing as the thing thinking itself in me. So there's even an element of passivity to the subject. So again, really, really, we're thrust into the world. We're in the middle of the world, not removed from it in any sense. Um, and so in qualities, this is one more thing I'll, I'll note here, qualities of things. Uh, when we sense things, we sense qualities in them. They only appear as um, after we've already grasped the thing itself. So individual qualities only appear as, um, I've written here, as a, as a pulverization of the thing. So once we've kind of taken the thing and dismantled it, then we see these individual qualities. Prior to that, the thing... is. The, the qualities are just in the thing. The thing is those qualities. Um, and what, or, or what they are, and what I've written is that they are the manners of being in the world proposed to me. So that, that's what sensing was. We can move down now to the next box, which is space. And this is... Um, First of all, it, it's derived from treating my body as a system for possible actions. So action is, is central to all of Moloponti's work here. Um, and space appears... Well, what he says is space is the means by which position becomes possible. So it's, it's really just a, a way of allowing us to orient ourselves in the world. And it, it happens um, through, primarily through action, through our bodies and, and the actions that we're able to carry out in that world. Um, so that's what, that's what space is. That's the phenomenological conception of space. Let's look at the body. We'll move to the body here. So the body is primarily our connection to the world. Uh, and there are three kind of sub subgroups that I've divided this, this into, spatiality, speech, and affectivity. So let's take those individually. Spatiality first. Um, this, one, this is different from space in the sense that this is not so much um, external. Spatiality from Ponti is more 
concerned with our bodies as as being the center, the locus of action. So in the, the, the section in the book, he talks about the body schema, which is basically the the um, it's not it's not positional like space was. So it doesn't it doesn't give us external positions. It's it's the way that we engage with the world. I'm, I'm going to repeat that that expression a lot. I think in this summary because everything really comes back to to these a few core ideas, and this is one of them: engagement with the world. It, everything really turns on that, and and spatiality is is or sorry the body schema. Is, is how we are grounded in the world. So it refers to, to our, um, our kind of the locus. Again, I talked about this regarding space as well, but, but this is more focused on the, the body itself the, the, uh, as the means through which we, um, we engage, we pick up things in the world. Um, so this also we a couple of other key concepts in this section were the intentional arc, which is the way that we project um, actions and goals into the world, the way that we project things, and, and that that really that those that projection that intentional arc projects things around us as well. So not just projecting our um, actions our projects onto fixed things but that intention has a hand in how those things appear for us that's what the phenomenal field is right everything everything we're talking about here goes towards how things appear for us and that that's one one key idea another part of this was motricity so the the, the motor aspect and that a nice expression to capture this, the way that Malo-Ponte talks about us being an I can rather than an I think. Really like that. So again, that, that real focus on action, practical. Um, so anyway, that's spatiality. Then we can, we can look at speech. Speech was uh, an important part of, of our engagement, of our, of our being in the world. Uh, and for Malo Ponte, speech was thought, actually. Uh, and he, he, I remember he, we talked about the, the orator and the way that the orator isn't, doesn't have a thought which he or she then has to convert to speech. Rather, the thought itself, uh, or what, what speech does, is it appropriates that thought. So it's... Um, the two are, are more closely intertwined. It's not we can't distinguish those so much so that for Malo Ponte, speech is thought and words bear the sense of the object. Again, that connection to how things appear for us. It's not we're not we're not at a remove from the world. We are everything we're talking about here is 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 playing a role in how things appear in this phenomenal field. Um, Another thing there was the way that speech from Malo Ponte is, is a gesture. It's a modulation of the body. So again, tying this into the body, really grounding us in the world. And also affectivity was there. Um, and basically the idea with this was that it, this creates an atmosphere in which things appear again for us. So this was... Um, these were the, the main ideas, uh, I think, in in the section of in this section of um, phenomenology of perception related to the body. Uh, let's okay, so let's have a look at the self as well. This this actually will jump, I think, to the thing and the natural world. We'll look at this first. So the thing in the natural world, three kind of subcategories here: perceptual constants. The intersensory thing itself and the natural world. So let's take those uh, perceptual constants. This this section really focused on our hold on things. 
the way that things appear for us, the way that um, things invite us to take them up. So these percept the, this this was quite focused on perception and how we we grasp things like size and and form, shape, distance, um, and again all of all of these ideas were, were wrapped up in in um, they all contained meaning they weren't something that we're kind of projecting separate from anything they go into the very thing itself um, so the intersensory thing itself is lived and given at the same time another important concept which can apply to just about anything uh, but there were two aspects that Milo Ponti um, focused on, which I'm focusing on here, to the to the thing itself, to the object. Uh, the first one was that was the thing as an object pole. That is to say, the thing as as object to my to to me as the subject. And and in this, when we grasp the thing in this way, it was burdened with those anthropological predicates. So it, it um, appeared a certain way in relation to me. But the thing also appeared in a different aspect as in itself. And in this, from this aspect, it appears as, it appears as other. So it, it has this, uh, we talked about this quite a bit in the video, it has this idea of insurmountable plenitude associated with it. So the thing kind of escapes me on all sides. I can't pin it down. It has different aspects, different features that <clears throat> don't um, register for me, that aren't meaningful for me, that, that I, I don't grasp, I don't see in my phenomenal field. And in that sense, it, it kind of overflows my, my grasp of it and appears as, as, as an other. Um, and I liked this as well. He he calls the thing an absolute mystery on the back of that, and says that when we drill deeper into the thing, when we go down inside, there's nothing inside except other smaller things. I really like that. Um, that that's so much out of Bergson that I I can't even express it here. But, um, but yeah, so that w no matter how deep we drill, there's just more things to find. So it's not just a mystery, it's an absolute mystery for us. And that, that relates to this, we talked, I talked about qualities earlier as a pulverization of the thing. Same thing here, when we, when we tear it apart to see what, what it's made of, we just find other things. We never get to a, a kind of an essence, a core anything that explains the thing we just get more things so um so that was nice and that's the intersensory thing and finally the natural world this one is so this is not an object it's the horizon of all my horizons it's kind of the background to end all backgrounds um so yeah it's, it's the background on which everything appears which everything ultimately plays out um, and this also, Milo Pondi describes as an absolute mystery, because there's nothing beyond the horizons except other horizons. Another nice, kind of from the opposite direction, you know, so drilling into the thing, we just get more things, and, and, and kind of expanding our, our view, um, we just get more horizons. So a nice, a really good kind of, meaty phenomenological description there. So that's the thing in the natural world. Let's have a look at others before we move on to the self. So others, this couple of key concepts here, they are known through the body um, as a as behavior. So not we, we don't know them as, we don't know other people as objects. We kind of relate to them immediately through the body, um, which is what we are as well. So there's there's, there's kind of a, a deeper connection, I think, the Milo Ponte is driving at there. We're not we're not separate consciousnesses, kind of interacting through my body as an instrument, 
to this other object as uh, as as a, as, a, as an object. Sorry, to, the, to this other body as an object in for my instrument, which refers to another consciousness. That, that there's um, this is all over intellectualizing the, the, the case. The, the our actual original primary engagement with others is um, is that we know them as as behavior through through our bodies so the other's body and mind form a system um, and this he talked about in more depth in the the article um, that i also made a separate video on i think it's called the child's relations with others um, but in there he talks about for the for the infant the other and and um, him or her form a kind of a, a, a totality, a system in, in, in and of themselves. So there's not this, again, our original engagement with other people is not, is not separate. We're, we're originally, fundamentally um, together with others. And so uh, what else do we have there? Language was a concrete bond established between me and the other so again more connections there however there is a there is a lived solipsism that cannot be transcended ultimately um, however a however again solipsism as a disbelief in the existence of the other can't be maintained so there is this kind of deeper solipsism in the sense that, that the other never means quite as much as as I mean to myself <clears throat> but the the kind of the, the, the worry of the existence of others how can we know that others exist for Molo Ponte that that's really a non-starter um, the social world is it's already it's a it's a permanent field of existence it's it's not a sum of objects out there, um, external to us. It's it's something we are we're already in the midst of. In order to ask the question, do others exist? We we already have to be certain that they are. If they didn't, or if it was even doubtful, um, we wouldn't be. The question wouldn't even arise for us. Anyway, so that, that that's the section on others. Finally, I want to look at this self, this idea of the self, the cogito. So there were kind of, what have I got there? I haven't got any sub, sub, um, sub boxes there. Um, but in the book we looked at, I've broken it into four, four sections, subject and world, subject and him or herself acts of pure thought, subject and him, him, him or herself as psychic facts, and finally the cogito. All right, let's take the first one. So subject and world, and the, the idea actually with all of these is that um, there's, there's a certainty, but there's also a, an uncertainty associated with each, each um, aspect of the self that we're going to look at. So the subject and the world, so our relation to the world, it's certain in the sense that consciousness is entirely transcendent. We are we are out there in the world. We're not locked away, separate from the world, kind of accessing it through this instrument composed of different sense organs. We are fundamentally in the world. Um, so it's certain in that sense, but it's uncertain and, and ambiguous. Not because, at the same time, not because the world is external to us, but because we are in the world. Because our very presence in the world means that it is, um, it, it appears with this, this, this kind of hazy ambiguity associated with it, and that that's one of the one of the key characteristics or features of the phenomenal field. Then there's the subject and, so that's the subject in the world, our relation to, to the world. We can also look at our relation to our own 
acts of pure thought. Yeah. And um, and so all of that we're looking for something something certain here. What can we what can we ground ourselves in? So when I want to look at acts of pure thought, can we ground ourselves in this? And again, there are two aspects. There's a certain aspect and an, and an uncertain one. It's certain in the sense that, or it's certain when, when it's lived, when we live our thoughts, when we give up the attempt to make um, our thoughts completely explicit to ourselves. Then when we just live those thoughts, that's, that's when we don't doubt them. We can't doubt them. But when we step back and kind of remove ourselves from, from that engagement, then uncertainty creeps in, doubt creeps in. Um, and Milo Pondi talks about ideas being grounded in my taking them up, that my thoughts transcend me. There's nothing, um, like with the speech, when we looked at speech, uh, thought and idea, there was no separation, which means that I'm not, I'm not removed from my, my thoughts. My thoughts kind of happen, they arise without my explicit direction. I don't know what I'm going to think before I think it. So even though those, those thoughts are certain when I'm, when, I'm in, when I'm living them, when I step back and try and, and, and take this look at them from a distance, then I get this, this uncertainty creeps in. Suddenly, um, I'm not those thoughts. I can kind of take a position on them and, and, and think about, you know, where did that come from? Why, why did I have that thought? So these all, um, our thoughts transcend us. And that, that's what grounds the uncertainty there. Also, we looked at psychic facts um, and, and wondered, can we, can we ground something certain here? Again, they're certain in the sense that they're lived, but uncertain in the sense that we can be mistaken about, about them. And these were primarily um, emotions, feelings from the Bondi. So we can be mistaken about our feelings, uh, and we're often motivated. They're often, they're often motivated by situational values, things that um, we're expected to feel in certain situations. So we've been kind of conditioned to feel certain ways. So that, that makes this also uncertain. So we've got these two, uh, there's, there's nothing that we can find which, which really grounds um, ourselves in anything fixed, in anything concrete. And that, that's what Ponty asks in this section. How can I be constituting my thoughts in general while never actually creating any one thought? And we got from this, and this was really the key idea here, the spoken cogito, which is the idea, and the silent or tacit cogito, which was the fleeting, ambiguous hold that we have on ourselves and the world. Um, and so that was kind of where Nolo Ponti ended up. In this in this section on the Kagito. So that's the top half. Then um, I've got this little box here, the problem of transcendence, and that is and the, the problem here is with well, the question: How can I be open to phenomena that transcend me and that nevertheless only exist to the extent that I take them up and live them? So this is, is kind of a problem that that we, we find at the end of our phenomenal our investigation of the phenomenal field. We are open to these phenomena um, which transcend us, but they only exist to the extent that we take them up in the first place. So there's kind of a paradox here, the problem of transcendence. 
<clears throat> and so to resolve this, we have to make the second reduction. And this carries us into the transcendental field. Now, a couple of things to say about this reduction, the second reduction. There's nothing, really, there's nothing metaphysical here. Okay, so we're still, we're still phenomenological. We're, we're still in phenomenology. So um, it, may, it may sound a bit strange to call the transcendent phenomenology, but, um, but, but we're, not, we're not really getting into metaphysics or anything. It, it's, this is still grounded in phenomenology. What is the transcendental field from my point of view? It's, it's essentially, he's looking to explain how the phenomenal field operates what is it that 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 grounds what what is the phenomenal field grounded in itself so we've, we've looked at this phenomenal field we've looked at the way things appear for us we've, we've analyzed these three different parts of it the self including the body um, and the cogito and uh, the thing and the natural world and others those were the three main components and then we've broken down how each of those things appear for us from a phenomenological perspective. But now Malafondi wants to say that how does that all how did that all fit together, those things? What what grounds the phenomenal field? And that's what the second reduction is is attempting to do. And that's why it's not metaphysics. It's not he's not looking to and it's kind of a tension. He really, I think, he really does need to go to metaphysics um, to properly do this, but but he never does. Um, and it leaves um, a little bit up in the air. I think at the end here, a little bit, and I, and I'll explain what I mean a little bit later. But but he, this is not. It's not. Um, He's not, he's not trying to kind of capture reality as it really is or anything like that. He's not, it's not metaphysical in that sense. Also, it's, this is not um, like mystical or you know, we're, not, we're, not, we're not uncovering any kind of deep truth about, about the nature of reality. It's, um, this is firmly grounded in, again, grounding the phenomenal field that's what we're doing so there, there's no there's no transition to anything um, anything I'm trying to think of a good word mystical or, or kind of supernatural or despite what you might think with the title it's it's just again like I say grounding the phenomenal field what is how does the phenomenal field cohere the, how do the different elements cohere together? And so you can see the, the box um, here is the main, the main box there is, is temporality and subjectivity. And that is what is going to be the glue, really, that holds everything together. And in that box, we see the self and the body and the world and others kind of feature in there, but but we see now how they how they are grounded, how they're connected in this deeper um, idea, which is temporality. So let's look at temporality first. So we'll take temporality or subjectivity. What was this? Okay, so a couple of things. We looked at the protension retention kind of model of understanding temporality. So it's not moments, it's not discrete moments, but there's a sense of um, kind of leaning into the future. Each, each moment is not fully encapsulated in the present. Each moment rather, again, this, and this is why it's, it's phenomenological, it's not, we're, we're leaning into the future at every point. And we're also carrying over things from the past so we're never we're never locked into this present moment we are straddling it in the past and in the future 
that was that was really key here. Another idea is that temporality has to be understood as a whole. So we can't, again, we can't separate out individual instants. That's always going to um, result in something that isn't temporality. It's going to give us something that, that's not temporality. Um, and is that, so he says something here which is, is a little bit metaphysical, leaning into the metaphysical. Um, and I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll just read it for you. Temporality is an absolute flow which appears perspectively to itself as a specific, a particular consciousness. Because it is a field of presence, it's a field of presence to itself, to others, and to the world. And that, that's a really... That really encapsulates this whole idea. An absolute flow which appears perspectively to itself as this consciousness. Because it's a field of presence. So we've got this, this idea then of another field here. And this is really temporality. It creates this field of presence. This um, the sense of being before certain things. The sense of being present to itself, others, and the world. Um, and and it, what, it, what it does here is kind of blurs the line then between temporality and subjectivity. And in fact, kind of merges them. So, which was, which, which is the goal and is quite metaphysical. But again, I don't, I don't feel like Merleau-Ponty really emphasizes that enough to make this um, a real metaphysical um, pronouncement. And, and it's very much in the vein of Bergson, but again, not something that Merleau-Ponty follows up enough, I think. So we've got this idea that temporality is, is kind of underlying everything and separate, creating, if you like, these fields of presence which which are what we are, which is what the individual consciousnesses are. Um, so that's very metaphysical, isn't it? <laughs> Despite everything I said, it's not metaphysical. But again, the reason I, I say that it's, it's not metaphysics is I don't, I, did, I just didn't feel Merleau-Ponty follows this idea through in any way. He tries to, he really keeps, keeps it um, phenomenological. So, there's an, an the notion of ecstasies in both time and subjectivity, which must be in both time and subjectivity because we've just seen they're actually intertwined. They're actually the same thing. So in time, each instant we've seen is outside itself in time as a whole. So again, time considered as it, as as an original. Um, as it really is, is not a, dis a collection of discrete instants. It's, it's a whole, and each instant is, um, is outside itself in the rest of the, the flow. And the same with subjectivity. We are not a discrete thing separate from everything else. We, we've already seen this. We are outside in the world. When we're, we're part of, of everything, connected in a way, communing with things. Uh, and also, it's uh, Malo Pondi talked about this temporality and subjectivity may, being, a, sorry, making explicit what was originally implicit. Uh, and so, temporality doesn't do that, but um, we can see this process playing out. In both temporality and subjectivity. So in time, um, what we get so time is is originally a whole, a complete thing, <laughs> a complete flow, and we we make it explicit by dividing it into those three ecstasies: past, present, and future. And the same with subjectivity. Originally, that is. A lived experience and when we when we break it down when we analyze it 
reflect on it, we make explicit the self, the world, and the thing. So again, breaking up what what is originally a whole. Um, such a Bergson, Bergsonian idea. Um, I really wish that, that Moabonte acknowledged that more. Actually, he, he barely mentions Bergson in the book, but his uh, his work really carries on from. It's it's just it's it's Bergson kind of carried and in, in through into phenomenology. It's um it's it's kind of surprising that he didn't didn't acknowledge that more. Anyway, so that was uh, making explicit of what was originally implicit, and the last thing I want to say with this one is is this nice expression, temporality temporalizes as a future that goes into the past by coming into the present. And that that is just what time is as a whole. Uh, and so, with that said, we can kind of look at those three, um, the three boxes there, self and body, and see how this connects with, with temporality or subjectivity. The self, the body, is grounded in the present. Sorry, the self is grounded in the present through the body. And ultimate subjectivity is, is where being and consciousness coincide in a field of presence. So we've got that, that connection, that, that kind of deeper level which explains self and the body. Same with the world and, and things. For this, I just thought that there's no world without a subjectivity, but there's no subjectivity without a world. And subjectivity is fundamentally temporality. So we've got that link again. And finally, others. Um, the, the classical conception of others is as consciousnesses separate from me, other cogitos, right? But Malo-Ponte reworks that and, and treats them as, or the, since we have reworked subjectivity as temporality, then we have, um, instead of consciousnesses, we can, we can then talk about other temporalities, which, unlike consciousness, unlike <clears throat> consciousnesses, are mutually compatible. So now we don't have this, this distinction me and the and others now we just have this temporality and that temporality which which can um appear for each other in in um on the horizons of each of each temporality in the same way that if i'm um if my subjectivity can be understood as as time then the, the past is a horizon for me in the in the um, backwards <clears throat> and the future is a horizon for me f forwards both of those are, are outside my immediate present and yet they they exist for me when we have no problem acknowledging their existence and living in in, in amongst them, if you like. And the same can be said then, if, if others are just other temporalities, then there's also no problem in, in having them exist in the same way that, that my past and my future exist for me. Um, and so that's kind of the grounding of those three aspects. And we also see the problem of transcendence be resolved through the overcoming of dualism. So if I read this for you, I am open to phenomena that transcend me and that nevertheless only exist to the extent that I take them up and live them because subject and object are two abstract moments that come together in presence. Beautiful idea. So the subject and the object are just, they're what we see after we have already broken apart the original reality, which is time, which is presence, this field of presence that, that Milo Ponte has been talking about. And so that's how everything kind of 
resolves into time for the Lord Ponte. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a little bit there about freedom. Um, we we looked at the way that freedom, uh, the this temporality, time essentially is what creates the freedom for Milo Ponte. What because every um, time is a continual flow, and each each new moment in the flow it represents a new opportunity to um, to start a new project. So we're just kind of, every moment is a new moment in which something new can arise. Lots of news in that. Um, and oh, what else do I want to say with that? He says it requires an already established field, which is not created by me. So it, there's an acknowledgement that we're not, we're not absolutely free in the sense of, in the way that Sartre wants us to be. Uh, and our habits as well represent a sedimentation of our life. Another one of those great words that Milo Ponte uses all the time. Uh, and nevertheless, despite those things, there is freedom through time. Um, and there's a nice expression which I'll, I'll read I'm sure I read it in the videos along with existence I got a style which conditions all of my actions and thoughts I am free not beneath this structure but through it I'm free as this structure so and, and that is really I've been thinking a lot about that recently actually I've been reading a little bit about um, evolution and, and the, the impact that genes have on us and that, that fits in with this. We're not we're not a, we're not beyond we're not free separate from our genes, from our environment, from our upbringing. We are we're free through those things. Those things all. We don't exist separate from them. Kind of bound to follow them, you know, slaves to our genes or slaves to our upbringing, but through that. Because we're fundamentally this temporality, we can um, we have freedom. And the uh, the last thing I wanted to mention here, it's not on the the diagram, but just a, a couple of general themes. There are three that I, I wanted to finish with. The first is we can't understand a thing by breaking it apart, and that's just all through Milo Ponte, so Bergsonian that. I just want to start talking about Bergson, but I won't. Um, yeah, breaking things apart is that thetic um, mode of thought. And, and that we can't understand a thing properly if we do that. If we, get, if, we, if we follow that route, we have to understand the thing non-thetically, which means it, by, ne by definition, it's going to be a little bit ambiguous. It's not going to be crystal crystal clear, black and white, um, it's going to be a bit hazy, but that's that's what the thing is, that's what life is. Um, and when we break something apart, when we when we analyze it in components, we lose the thing we were we were looking for. Uh, and that that's a real core idea. Another one is that we are in the world in fields. And this is the way that things first appear for us, through these fields. That is to say, things appear imbued with meaning, although it's ambiguous, uncertain, and incomplete. So fields are a really important concept for Milo Ponte. Again, nothing mystical about this. It's not, there's, no, there's no energy fields or anything. It's just the way that... It's phenom these are phenomenological ideas, the way that we engage, um, the way that we the, the way that we pick things up, the way that things have meaning for us, is 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 through this this idea, this concept of fields. Uh, so then we looked at the phenomenal field, there's the transcendental field, and and that that field of presence, which was part of temporality, which is important. And finally, subjectivity is essentially 
a making explicit of what was originally implicit. And we see that with, with everything, actually. What subjectivity does is, is take that, the whole, the, 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 the lived experience, and make explicit different parts of it. Pull those parts out and, uh, and, um, and attempt to make sense of it. But again, when we do that, we, we, we end up not understanding the thing we were looking to, to grasp in the first place. Okay, that's my summary. That was much, much longer than I expected it was going to be. I talked from, as I always do, talked for, for too long probably. But, um, but that's my account of um, phenomenology of perception. I don't know, the, I was looking at the, the diagram, all those colors, they're not supposed to be, like I didn't, I didn't select colors to match, it's not, um, it's not an art project, it was, I just, I wanted different colors actually for different, for each of the different parts, so it's kind of, it's kind of not pretty to look at, but, uh, but hopefully it's, it's a little bit clearer for it. Uh, anyway, so that, that's what I have to say about phenomenology of perception. Finally, we're finished. The next video um, I make will look at Henri Bergson, finally. Um, so I'll see you for that one. Thanks for listening, as always, guys, um, and see you shortly.